Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome back to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. Well, a happy and fortunate Friday the 13th to all of you watching in the world. I hope this has been an auspicious day for you and that there is a lovely weekend to come. But before your weekend starts, start it off with us. Remember, the best place to buy, trade, and sell watches is thewatchbox.com. It's where I buy my watches. It's also where I plant most of my videos. So when you're not watching me here, you can watch me there and get the lowdown on all of the watches we've got in stock, including some of my favorites, Extreme Lab 2 in blue, absolutely superb. That said, remember, the best place to follow us is always right here on Watchbox Studios, so subscribe if you haven't already. Okay, wrist shot real quick. I think you guys know this watch fairly well, but let's do a quick macro. For those of you who are new to the program and maybe haven't subscribed yet, hint, subscribe. This is my Chagere LeCoult Reverso Platinum Number no. 2 Tourbillon. It is the second Platinum Reverso. It came out in 2003. You can see it's got a white gold movement with a Cote de Soleil or a Rayon Sunburst style Cote de Genève. Blued screws, hand engraved gaudrons around the bottom of the cage. That's actually at the top of the screen right now. It's got an overcoil. Beautiful 21,600 vibration per hour beat rate, and actually it's a fascinating piece because it has a gorgeous and rather refined dial with ruthenium coating, sterling silver hand-painted brigade numerals, and the dial itself is actually an 18 karat white gold base. So that is probably the watch that's gotten the most wrist time on my wrist this year so far. Okay. So I want to emphasize, remember, the watchbox.com, the best place to buy, trade, and sell, and maybe even score yourself one of these this weekend. Okay, this or that Geneva jousting. This is an interactive feature, guys. All those welcome aboard in live stream land. I have posted the poll to the live description box, so you can start voting before I start the segment. Also, link in the description to the poll. Now, first in the chat box, Matt Foster, hi. Geneva jousting, F. Pijorn Chronomet Bleu versus Jepec Kiedeberg. Now, this is a showdown between two independents based out of Geneva. One is a reigning champion and a living legend. You're going to tell me which one you want, and the other is a bit of an upstart and just recently released for 2018 with this gorgeous rainforest green dial. So let's start with the established power, the FP Journ Chronomet Bleu. This is a watch that first came out in late 2009, an absolute sensation in that it's not the kind of watch you settle for. Normally, the entry-level watch for a brand is something that you buy begrudgingly, almost like, okay, I can't afford a Patek Philippe 5316 grand complication, so I'm going to buy an entry-level, you know, 5116, or I'm going to shoot for maybe an Aquanaut 5167. This is not a watch you settle for. Once you've got your Journe Grand Sonnerie, once you've got your Perpetual Calendar, once you've got all three of the Vagabondage series, you still have to sit on a wait list to get this watch. The simplest and lowest priced watch FP Journe makes, it is somehow also one of the most in demand and wait listed. And I actually have some exclusive production figures for this one later in the segment to show you just how rare it is. Now, 39 millimeters in tantalum, this is a watch that is not precious metal, but has the feel of precious metal on the wrist. And because of the hardness of tantalum, it also has a great deal of scratch resistance. Spectacular metallic and gloss blue dial. I know how it's made. I've seen it made. I'm not allowed to tell you. Just consider this. It has both the elements of gloss and gleam that you'd get with lacquer and a metallic luster that you would get with high polished metal. I can't say any more than that. Caliber 1304 adjusted in an exceptional six positions chronometer style. You can see three different finishes, linear Cote de Genève, a barley corn across the base plate, and then there's also a prolage just beneath the free sprung balance. It has a 56 hour power reserve via the twin mainspring barrels. Note the hidden drivetrain for the balance. There's actually an open channel between the barrels and the balance itself with no visible train other than the escape wheel itself. It is exceptionally accurate and FP Journ flouts the COSC by labeling it chronomet. And by convention in Switzerland, you must be COSC certified to use that label. He does not. He says, my standard is higher than yours. I'm calling it a chronometer. Now, the watch has 18 karat gold plates and bridges. As you can see, it's a hefty and substantial 39 millimeter timepiece and 22,800 US dollars. This is the point of entry to FP Journ ownership, and it's wait listed years, not months. Now, I know for a fact that last year, 110 pieces were made, and in any given year, about 110 to 150 will be made. Last year, F.P. Journ made about 650 watches, so this is a seriously exclusive watch. I love this watch, but I will say, 
I'm up for a challenge, and tonight's challenger is right up my alley. Jepec and C is a Kickstarter crowdfunded brand reestablished in Geneva, actually bearing the name of Antoine Norbert de Patek's original business partner from about 1839 to 1844. Jepec started launching its first watches in 2015 with the K de Berg. Now, the watch you see here is a variant of that model. And 38.5 millimeters in stainless steel, you can actually see on the wrist what it looks like in a less airbrushed and manipulated photo. This is courtesy of Alcura One, full credit on the Purist Pro Forum. But the watch has a beautiful rainforest green guilloche dial, a complex case profile. It has steel case with multiple finishings, as you can see, polished satin and media blasted to go up against the tantalum polish of the Jorn. But what really sets this apart is the rose lathe guilloche dial. Now it is a rose lathe guilloche dial. Some of them in this collection are galvanized. This one is actually lacquered. So you have both rose lathe guilloche and what they call a ricochet pattern and a beautiful lustrous green lacquer to achieve that color. The hands and the indices are beautifully shaped and distinctive and sharply faceted for high contrast. And you can see right between four and five, there's a scale that is both your power reserve indicator and your day of the week indicator. You just have to remember to always wind it on the first day of the week to ensure that it's accurate. Now, the watch has a beautiful dial that is m made by Metalem, and in a rare instance of sharing credit, Jepec actually prints the name of the Geneva dial manufacturer, Metalem, at the base of the dial at six o'clock on the seven o'clock side of the index. Now, I'll also say, that caliber SXH1 by Jean-Francois Mohan's Chronode Company is a true high horology movement with twin mainspring barrels, a seven-day power reserve. It has a beat rate of 21,600. It features the dial side power reserve and beautiful finishing that is actually not just finished to a high degree, but the architecture around the finishing is self-consciously styled to recreate the profile and positioning of the barrel and train on antique Jepec pocket watches. So there's a lot going on here, and that's before we even get to the beautiful kiln-fired oxidized screws. Okay, what's your damage for all of this finery? Well, it's actually quite reasonable, as the Rainforest Green Kedeberg actually costs 15000 400 US dollars, meaning it undercuts the Jorn by quite a bit. Now there's the elephant in the room, which is resale. You could buy that Jorn and sell it for more than you paid. The Jepec, I'm not sure. They're not an established brand yet. They've been shipping watches since 2015. And while business has been brisk and they are growing in every major market, FP Jorn still has a head start in terms of brand equity and name recognition. Only 10 of these will be made, however, seven of which remain available. So you guys tell me, which one do you prefer? Let's bring up the poll, which one is currently leading? So far, you guys are voting, and I think the real-time tabulation as our crew, okay, wow, that's a slaughter. Yeah, that, that, is, that is like Hannibal at Cannae. That is a complete rout of the Romans. Uh, Jepec being the Romans in this case. Okay, I'm going to side with the little guy. I love that green dial, but then again, you guys know me. That's how I style. Okay, welcome guys. I can see we've got a ton of chatter in the in the chat box. Let me quickly bump, 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 see what you guys are saying. Okay, Jumbo Jet Pilot, Jepec, never heard of it, but that's a great looking watch. And I can see Kyle K saying, I wonder if the dial matches that strap that well in person. We did have the live wrist shot of an actual person on Watch Pro site who handled it. So if you're watching this recorded, go back and take a look. That's actual coloration as seen in person. Uh, then we have high and rising. That's not a real power reserve indicator if the power indicator is based on the day of the week rather than the actual potential energy in the watch. Well, it kind of isn't. It's a seven-day power reserve. It's double-sided. One side points to a number. One side points to a day of the week, and it turns like this. So it's a real power reserve indicator. You could argue it's not a real calendar complication. We'll keep coming back to this as the episode progresses. Okay, so let's talk about some quick hits because a lot of interesting stuff happened. But first, Asia Pacific viewers, remember, watch boxes open in Hong Kong. Visit our physical location and see some of the cool watches that you may have seen on our website. Some of them are in Hong Kong, and they're all waiting for you to try on firsthand.
or first wrist. Okay, stay online with me after the episode of Tim underscore Maso on Instagram. I will say my Instagram has become a little passion project for me. I like the watches to be big and colorful and vivid. They should be so bright and scintillating that you can taste them and so loud that you can hear them. It's a bit of an art project, but if you want to see watches as they will be represented nowhere else on Instagram, Tim underscore Maso. Remember, this is less of a sales effort and more of my own personal gallery of imagined watches, the watches you imagine them, just as Kiss is the rock band as you imagine it, not necessarily the reality of the Beatles and mop hair, but superheroes, fireworks, sparkles, and glitter. That's my Instagram. So if you're into that, Tim underscore Maso. Now, let's quickly show some wrist shots that you sent me. Okay, Simon H. sticks with independent horology while sporting his Lang und Heine, Frederick III, not Langa, Lang and Heine, and a wonderful brand it is. They make between 100 and 150 watches a year in a great year, typically between about 70 and 120. That is high horology at its best. Now, Dr. Bobby K blasts off with his formidable Speedmaster collection, and he does seem to have one of everything awesome. He's got a pre-moon 105 in there, uh, both silver Snoopies, 2015 and 2003. He has the 2008 Project Alaska, the Tintin, and much more. That is an impressive collection of Speedmasters. Speedy Tuesday is jealous. Now, Dan P. keeps it simple with his discontinued Rolex Oyster Perpetual, a gorgeous piece that I absolutely love. I actually have one on my Watchbox Reviews channel that is very similar to that right now. Okay, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on my pixels. Bum, 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 and I see Marco Asoto is saying, Tim F. P. Jorn all the way. And Mike K. saying he would go to the, eight, the Hong Kong watch box store. So would I. I would. And I might come in for a special visit sometime. Okay. Now, quick hits. These are quick news bites I want to get to you without excessive exposition. The Blancpain 50 Fathoms Grand Dot. This is a watch that came out at Basel World that we really didn't talk about. We talked a lot about the Bathyscaphe Day Date. We talked a lot about the Villaray Jump Hour Retrograde Flying Tourbillon. This watch right here might have been the best premium dive watch and, and possibly even the best Blancpain released. We didn't talk about the watch. Arguably better balanced than the original Blancpain 50 Fathoms reference 5015 of 2007, this one has a beautifully anchored and balanced grand date that is both easier to read and promotes better symmetry about the dial arrangement. I will also say this technically reference 5050 throws all kinds of shade on the 2018 Breguet 5517 Marine. That's the titanium one for 18,800 US dollars. For 17,500, you could have that Blancpain with the five day power reserve, the 45 millimeter high polish case, the grand date, the free sprung escapement, the high horology movement, and frankly, a case that doesn't look like a Ulysse Norden. Blancpain, I still love you, even though Breguet gets all the love from the Swatch Group's budgeting departments. Moritz Grossmann. Okay, one of the smallest companies in German independent horology wins two red dot awards this past week with the Bennu Tourbillon, which features a gorgeous combination of white, gold, and black dial in that iteration. Very limited, I believe 10 are available in that particular style, as well as the Atom Enamel in rose gold. And I want to say something like 25 to 35 of those are available. But a great recognition for a company that has only been around since 2008, and even by the relatively recent standards of German watchmaking, revived after the fall of communism, that is an impressive upstart effort. I will also say that the Red Dot Award is an interesting mix of rooting for the home team and acknowledging great design generally. As the Red Dot Award is given out by the Design Zentrum of uh, North Rhine Westphalen, which is a design museum in Germany. Now, like I said, there's always a little bit of home field advantage for the Germans, but past awardees have included Apple, Ferrari, BMW, and Nomos. So this is a giant killing effort from Moritz Grossmann. Speaking of which, Nomos also awarded its own red dot for 2018 for its Autobahn Neomatic 41 that just came out three weeks ago at Baselworld. Three pieces, 41 millimeters, all steel, highly water resistant and rare for a Nomos delivered on a textile strap. The concave dial designed after a combination of vintage racetracks with banking and vintage automobile gauges is wonderfully compelling and almost anyone can find a version of this watch among the three that they like. I'm happy that Nomos has been recognized and so soon, that's impressive. Okay, 
Vauche Manufacture wants you to get excited, not about a watch, but about a part of a watch. And let's face it, we're watch nerds, so we probably will get excited about the new Seed VMF 6710. It is a 30 millimeter automatic chronograph movement that's designed to work as a drop-in replacement for the also 30 millimeter Valjoux 7750. Now this is a huge upgrade from a 7750. It'll be offered for purchase by customers far and wide. Finely finished and refined examples were launched by a uh, Valche parent Parmigiani Fleurier in the 2018 SIHH Parmigiani Kalpa Chronograph Chronometer and Kalpograph Chronor that came out at the Geneva exhibition this year. So standard fitment for this caliber, what you get right out of the box, box stock, is adjustment in a chronometer grade five positions with a COSC certificate. You get ceramic rotor bearings, a 65-hour power reserve, a full balance bridge, and a free-sprung balance for toughness. You get vertical clutch engagement, a column wheel function selector, and a 36,000 vibration per hour beat rate, date with quick set and hacking seconds. It is a very impressive package for a turnkey movement. Now, I will say that the VMF 6710 has already found one outstanding application in the enamel or guilloche dial, JPEC NC, Falberg de Krakowy chronograph. So you've actually got a JPEC watch that is not the Kata Berg that is already employing the superb automatic high beat chronometer chronograph movement. And at 25,000 US dollars, the price is right inside and out. That is a very impressive watch. Moving on tonight, guys, this is an interactive show, so if you've got any questions or comments, I'll do my best to follow the live chat box. I can see JBO Surf saying the Blancpain 70s tribute launched at Basel World is excellent. He's talking about the Day-Date 70s tribute that will be a 500-piece limited edition, highly 70s themed. It is a part of the Bathyscaphe collection, not the traditional 50 Fathoms, and one of the most stridently 70s watches I've seen from a mainstream brand. It's nothing if not bold, but it works. I can also see right now, Sh um, Shnam13 is saying, hi, Tim. Howdy. And I can see Rich Buddy saying, I like that Rolex. That was a very impressive Oyster Perpetual 36 from our friend Dan P. Okay, keep the questions coming. And question from uh, Jonathan Syriac. Hey, Tim, what do you think the Laurent Ferrier annual calendar do you think the Laurent Ferrier annual calendar is worth paying up for over a used Patek annual? Well, I think right now Laurent Ferrier is pretty hot. They are an it brand at the moment, and I've heard that authorized dealers are having trouble getting inventory because almost solely on the basis of East Asia, they're sold out. So they have one market that's causing them to be effectively sold out, leaving every other market deprived. And make no mistake, if they made twice as many watches right now, they could probably sell them. So the Montclair Ecole annual calendar. Is it worth paying up for over a Patek annual? I can only say that you should buy the watch that looks better to you. Buy the watch that physically looks better to you because if you buy a watch that you think looks inferior to another, you will have settled. And as we discussed on Monday, that is one of the core causes of buyer's remorse for collectors. When you buy your second choice or you settle below what you ultimately thought was your ambition as a collector, if it's within reach for you to get your first choice and you're not going to spend money that you don't have, I say go for the Laurent Ferrier annual because they're beautifully made, they're highly distinctive, and objectively, there are a lot of Patek Philippe annual calendar watches out there. They've been making them since 1996 over many series. The 5035, I have no idea how many tens of thousands of those they made, and that's one model only. So I would actually say go for the Laurent Ferrier. I don't see the value of that watch crashing over the next two to three years. I think that it's a strong brand with room to run, and even if demand were to drop off, there's still enough pent-up demand from other markets than Asia that they could sell out their production. So consider right now, the world is demanding eight units. They're supplying four. If demand were to be curbed down to five or six units, they would still have a lack of capacity. So you're in a good place right now to buy Laurent Ferrier, whether you buy something like the new Minute Repeater or you go with one of the classics like the Galley Micro Rotor. So I think it's a good buy, ultimately buy the watch that appeals to you most, because if it's not going to appeal to you here, it's not going to be intellectually justifiable either. 
Okay. And I can see Barry BKT saying Patek all day long. UXXV, any comment on the Rolex BLNR being discontinued as it is no longer in the 2018 catalog or price list or dealer websites? As of just a few days ago, it was still on Rolex's website. So I would say for the moment, it may just be that no one wants to take an order for a watch that no one can obtain. But if it reliably disappears from all catalogs, including the Rolex website. Again, two weeks ago, it was still on the Rolex website, and that was post Basel World. So let's double check to see that this is really a discontinued watch as opposed to a really tough to get watch that dealers have simply stopped advertising. Okay. Now, also important, Mike K saying um, FP Journe prefers his watches over your JLC watches, and he told me as much. So that was a fact. At a dinner I actually had with him with a group of guys who went over to visit the Jorn factory, he told me that he liked my dual met, but it was too thick. And he did admit that his Chronomet Optimum, which is the most accurate watch he knows how to make, is too thick, which is why he will never use that double direct impulse escapement in anything else. So he grudgingly respects a thick chronometer, he just doesn't like them. All right, moving on to the meat of our program tonight. By the way, comment if you are watching this recorded or subscribe if you haven't. We love our subscribers. Get our content. We broadcast uh, four to six days a week right now. We're working on the schedule. Josh and, Josh and Jason, by the way, will be coming back with their own show soon. New watches. Okay, Ulysse Norden. Ulysse Norden freakout collection. So four new Ulysse Nordin Freak models. These are some of the most appealing and accessible high horology watches you can buy at any price. SIHH this year focused on the immensely innovative automatic winding Freak Vision. But the real headliner for Ulysse Nordin's 2018 model year and the most affordable and practical Freak yet is the Freakout Collection. So this is a watch that is a rare application of base metal, in this case titanium, on Ulysse Norden's signature watch line. All cases are 45 millimeters. They feature a reprofiled bezel, which is also used to set the watch, and one of two finishes. You can actually get blasted titanium, which is a media blasted sort of matte finish titanium, or you can get black titanium, which is diamond-like carbon coated. You can see the two aesthetics equally striking on the wrist ergonomically, they're the same. Titanium is almost unnervingly light if you're not familiar with it. I will say they feature a handsome contrasting caliber that really makes the aesthetic of the watch. And the contrasting caliber and the dials ensure striking visuals. So if you're new to the Freak and you're not really sure what you're looking at, this is a model line that's been around from 2001 that features a carousel tourbillon. Sometimes a carousel is like a tourbillon, but there's a separate drive powertrain for the tourbillon uh, or rather for the, the escapement and the entire assembly. So the whole movement moves, but there's a separate powertrain for the escapement as well as the rotating carriage. So if you stop the carriage, it doesn't stop or break the tourbillon. That's why you can turn it back and forth and set the time while moving the entire movement and not stopping the balance because it's a carousel, not a tourbillon. There is a Freak Diavolo which features both. But this watch right here was actually Patrick Hoffman's final project as CEO of Ulysse Norden. And so this is his lasting legacy. He was with the company from, I want to say about 1999 when he founded Ulysse Norden USA and later went back after the death of Rolf Snyder, company owner and guiding light and patriarch in about 2013 to become the CEO. And this was Patrick Hoffman's baby. So he deserves full credit for the release of this line. This is kind of his valedictory with Ulysse Norden. I will also say the UN Caliber 205, again, if you're new to this, that is the movement. The whole thing is sitting in a baguette style assembly on the dial and it moves around with the movement acting as the minute hand and underneath it's superimposed over an hour hand. What you're looking at is a movement that is set using the bezel. There is a lock so you can't move it by accident. It features a pioneering dual impulse escapement in silicon. You can see that with the blue and the purple wheel right next to the balance. Also note that it is still one of the seven-day power reserves. The Freak, if we go back to that for a second, the full screen, the Freak Vision that came out here is automatic winding. It's, it's about a two-day power reserve. This is still the manual wind seven-day power reserve. And you'll note on the blue dials 
all of the pivot sapphires, instead of being synthetic rubies, rubies, they are chemically identical but aesthetically more pleasing, clear sapphires for all of the pivot stones. Very beautiful, and you can see how the wheels contrast in gorgeous fashion against the backdrop. Now, you also note the silicon escapement and the silicon hairspring. The Freak was the first with this in the industry back in 2001. It wasn't just the carousel layout, the winding with the case back, the setting with the bezel. It was the direct impulse silicon escapement, now also with the silicon hairspring made in-house. And 3HM water resistance, this is a relatively new development since 2014 for the Freak. Previously, they were completely non-water resistant. Ultimately, a sailcloth strap with a deployant clasp is what you get here. There are four models. There's the Freak Out Full Black, where everything, case and dial and movement are black. The Freak Out Black Gold, where everything is black save the train, which is made of gold wheels or I should say gold gilded wheels. There's the Freak Out Blue, and then there is the Freak Out Blue Gold, which is the blue with the gold train wheels. 48,000 US dollars makes this the most accessible freak ever. I would say this is a buy with confidence style watch. You get what you pay for. This is high horology innovation and one of the most important modern watch lines historically. All freaks are milestone watches. If you want the iconic Omega, you buy a Speedmaster Professional. If you want the iconic Audemars Piguet, you buy a 15202 Jumbo. And if you want the iconic Ulysse Norden, you get yourself a freak. And this is the most affordable and sportiest version available. Okay. I can see J.D. Michael just joining us in the chat box. Hello, everyone. Hello, J.D. Michael, and welcome aboard. And I can see Eric Nielsen saying, Tim, your bud Ariel Adams said he could see himself becoming a freak collector if they didn't cost $80,000 each. Well, I can tell you pre-owned, most of them don't cost $80,000. If you want to buy one new with a warranty, never a bad thing, $48,000 is now the price of admission to one of the hottest rides in the world of high horology. That freak is an absolute roller coaster. You don't have to be this tall to ride. You do have to have 48 grand. Okay. A company known for sports watches and relatively affordable watches brings us an expensive dress watch, and I love it. This is the Tutema Patria Power Reserve. Now, the watch may not be what you associate with Tutema of Germany. They are kind of a sports watch, entry level type horology brand. This is a little bit different. This is high horology in the strictest sense. Not necessarily the genre for which Tutema is known, but sublime. Now, a rifle for the IWC Portuguese family, another German-speaking watch brand, albeit on the other side of the German-Swiss border. This is a 43mm 18-carat machine. Let's go back to full screen if we can, guys, because I'd rather you see the watch than my face right now. The gold of this case is redder than my shirt. 43 millimeters, 18 karat rose gold. You're getting a manufacturer, Tudema caliber 618 with 27 joules, beats away at 3 hertz or 21,600 vibrations per hour. This caliber 618, based on the prior 617, is manually wound with a 65 hour power reserve. It features a free sprung balance for durability and a Breguet overcoil hairspring for precision in any position. It is fully adjusted. You'll also note it is beautifully made with traditional jewels set in chaton, pocket watch style, with a three-quarter pocket watch style bridge. It's borrowing a lot of design language on the movement side from Alanga Unzona and doing it beautifully. This is German watchmaking of the finest kind from a place you might not expect it. I will also say that it has elaborate gilded bridges with a gorgeous rose gold tone to match the case and impressively both black polished screws for beauty and 50 meter water resistance which is more than you expect from the dress watch category where two to three ATM rules. Now, a dial side power reserve is the complication added over the prior 617 calibers. You can see that dial side power reserve at 9 o'clock to give a little bit of differentiation from the IWC Portuguese automatic. I will say this too, reference 6602-01 costs 16,000 euro. I don't have a dollar equivalent for that because oftentimes euro prices are priced to include VAT, which we don't have in the United States. So if you were to buy this watch in the U.S. or outside of the Eurozone, I can almost assure you your price would be lower than the converted equivalent of 16,000 euro in your own currency. So I actually think this is a great value. Yes, it's probably going to get soaked in terms of re resale value because it's not a Patek Philippe, it's not an Audemars Piguet, but even Audemars Piguet's dress watches resale-wise are an Audemars Piguet's. There's AP's Royal Oak, and then there's everything else. There's Patek's 
Nautilus, and Aquanaut, and then there's all their gold dress watches. And this kind of falls into that category. Right now, gold dress watches are not hot unless your name is F.P. Jorn. This is as good as anything else out there in the sub-20,000 euro price range, and I strongly recommend it even if it comes from unconventional quarters. All right. Best article of the week. I like to call out the best article written by watch journalists for watch enthusiasts each week. Sometimes it's about people. Sometimes it's about product. Sometimes it's about the industry. This week it's about product. So the Grubel 4C Quadruple Tourbillon Blue in-depth. This is from Watch Collecting Lifestyle. Link in the, in the description. The pinnacle of independent watchmaking as only Halim Trujillo of Watch Collecting Lifestyle can present it. Now, Grubel 4C exhibited at both SIHH and Basel this year. They had three models at SIHH. This was their flagship at Basel World. The Grubel 4C Quadruple Tourbillon Blue is the flagship of their Basel launch for the 13-year-old company. They're out of Le Chaux de Fonds, Switzerland, and that is the cradle of Swiss watchmaking. They make about 100 watches in a good year. 80 to 100 watches is about Grubel 4C's speed. They make about one watch per employee, which means a tremendous amount of manual labor goes into making these things. The article does more than show what that entails. This is an article that explains. Now, most articles about sky-high horology give us a peek at something we'd never encounter firsthand, and that's good. But this article by Watch Collecting Lifestyle helps to advance our understanding of the factors behind the price structure and the legitimate effort that justifies a price of three quarters of a million U.S. dollars. Now, prices for this watch start at 735 grand and go up to 755,000 and above, but Watch Collecting Lifestyle's superb macro photography brings readers as close as possible to the finishing that has been described as the best in the industry, rivaled only by the likes of Philippe Dufour and possibly Romain Gauthier. It's one matter to show readers something exceptional. A more advanced approach conveys real insights and promotes understanding. Now, many will recoil at the idea of a professionally engineered, expertly hand-finished, and laboriously constructed and adjusted watch that costs $750,000. But we think a house made of nails, plywood, bricks, concrete, and tile priced at that same level almost seems routine, if a bit luxurious. Well, you need to think of them as on par, as works of virtuosity by grand artisans. This article delivers in that it showcases the Grubel 4C that you imagine. Really, what justifies their reputation? All of it's rolled into the photography and the description. The lurid, elucidating language of this article will take you into the heart of the watch, and you'll really understand what Grubel 4C is about and where the hype comes from and why it's justified. It'll give you um, an opportunity to close the gap between original assumptions and ultimate understanding of the watch's rarity, price, and prestige. Now, the backbone of the article is built around a long-form discussion of the art of black polish and how it applies both to the movement and the unique black polished blue dial of this timepiece. Yes, that's right. It has four tourbillon, and those are not the highlights. It's the black polished dial. The article explains why. Ultimately, I cannot recommend any article written in the watch space more highly than this for this week. Final viewer wrist shots. Okay, international edition, our friends from far and wide. If you're staying up early, or if you're getting up early and staying up late, you might see your watch here. Elton from Dublin stays up late to join us with his Cartier Roadster. This is a grand reference that debuted Cartier's quick-release lugs reborn in this year's Santos. Uh, this is a watch that needs to be reissued, and like right now. Um, also, we have Amintas N joining us from the UAE with his Patek Fleet 5726. And we have Ivalo P from Bulgaria giving us a rare smartwatch with his Sunto Essential Copper. We love all watches here on This Week in Watches. Ivalo, thank you so much. Okay, comment and subscribe, guys. Remember, we have content almost every day of the week coming to you from this channel, but also on Watchbox Reviews. Subscribe to them both. I would say everyone who's watching this recorded, please comment in the box below. Subscribe if you haven't, and stay online with me when the broadcast ends at Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. It's where the fun continues, even when the camera goes dark. Thanks to everyone. Have a great weekend. This is The Week in Watches. I'm Tim. This is Watchbox Studios, and thanks for logging on.